You know, sin changes everything. In fact, it does. It's changed us from what we were originally meant to be. But somebody did something about that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study as we study the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We do that every day. And today we're looking at Luke chapter 7. What a good read. This is amazing. So, Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm studying the life of the disciple whom Jesus loved, John. All right, that's excellent. John is an excellent disciple. We're going to get to his gospel shortly, so that's going to be good. What did you do? We have a question today, and it'll be coming to you from Luke chapter 7, so make sure that you've read ahead. All right, so Ryan is going to answer the question today. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, so he might ask me for help, but I don't know that I'll do that. So get your Bible out, and let's turn to Luke chapter 7 and your Bible guide as we begin to explore God's wonderful Word. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Now when he had concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. I have a question for you. What happens when we, you and I, face trouble? Do we panic? Oh no! Or do we pray, oh God? Or do we do both? Now when the centurion, and that is a Roman term, heard that Jesus Christ was near, he took action and sent some of the elders of the Jews to Jesus to plead with him to come and heal his servant. That's incredible. A centurion did this. Now, he's not mentioned by name, but we do know that the centurion was a man who cared for the people of Israel and did well for them. He was respected by both the local priest and the Levites. Luke chapter 7 tells us that the centurion was so well respected Here's what they did. The elders pleaded earnestly with Jesus on his behalf. How interesting to find such a man in the ancient Roman Empire. His faith and belief in the work and the authority, the authority of Jesus Christ was astounding. In fact, uh, Jesus told the crowd, he said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Luke chapter 7, verse 9. Now, as we look at this, it becomes striking, and we begin to explore this story, and there's only really one way to title it, show of faith. That's what we're talking about today. We look at Luke chapter 7. This, this is an amazing image of faith from a person who's not even Jewish, not even part of their culture, but he has a connection with God somehow, through his Jewish friends, he knows that there's got to be something out there. 
And this connection with God pays off in many ways as he knows Jesus Christ is from God. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're arguing about it. He's not arguing. He sees authority when he sees the power and he sees the power. He knows it. So get your Bibles and turn to this particular passage and get your Bible guide, turn to today. And if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? You can write to us or you can call us if you want to. Uh, and uh, my advice would be sim simply send the, whatever you can, whatever God speaks to your heart, pray about a gift and send that. And um, also go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, new website. I'm really excited about it uh, because it's really cool. A new website and uh, you can click on the Bible guide and get your copy there by making a donation as well. You can get it right away there. And uh, it's very important. Now, now we need to pray and ask the Lord to show us all of these things so that we can see in our hearts what he's doing. Father, I pray, help us to see you. Now, I know there's, you know, we've got Facebook and we've got, you know, Instagram and we've got all this other stuff around here and around there and Twitter and everything else. And, and, and but we need to stop. We need to shut everything off. We need to listen to you. We don't need to be interrupted. We need to listen to you just for a few minutes. We need to listen to what God says to us. Help us to do that. Help us to take what's in here and apply it to our heart, not apply what's in here to that. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. Let's look at this passage, Luke chapter 7. It's a great passage. Now, when he concluded all his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, village of Nahum. That's what it means. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent the centurion, it sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged Jesus, begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation, they said, and he has built us a synagogue. Wow, that's amazing. You see, here's what we need to see in this. Sin changes everything. It is the Lord who helps us and keeps us from perishing. We are healed and our spirits live forever, forever when we follow Jesus Christ. Christian, that's what you are. Christian, if you are a Christian, you follow Jesus Christ. Don't follow your sin. And as we understand that, as we read, okay, Lord, if this centurion recognizes you, he has a deep need, his, his servant is dying and he loves his servant and, and it's falling apart and he's trying to do the right things and he's asking you to be involved with him. I need to read, let me hear, let me see this. And so let's read on. And here's what the scripture says. Then Jesus went with them and when he was already not far from the house, he wasn't far, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. Don't do it. For I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy. I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But simply say the word. Just talk, Jesus, and say, your servant is healed, and my servant will be healed, for I am also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hmm. You see, the soldier knew and understood authority. Jesus Christ is the authority authority over all of heaven and earth. He told us that. Jesus Christ told us he is the authority. Now, as we look at this, we begin to see this and put this together. We begin to understand when we pray, Lord, your will be done and your will come on earth. Your will come on earth as it is in heaven. We understand what God is saying to us and what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. Now, Let's go on because this is good. This is chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And he turned around and he said to the crowd that followed him, he said, 
I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house, you know what they did? They went to the servant and you know what they found? They found the servant well, <laughs> the one who had been sick. I, this is an amazing story, beloved. See, Jesus marveled at the centurion's strong faith. Didn't matter who he was. What mattered was he had strong faith, beloved. This kind of faith comes from God as we willingly, willingly give him our lives and learn to put our trust in him. We don't put our trust in our paycheck. Our trust in this guy, or if we don't have, if we need help or whatever, we're just going to go talk to somebody. Hold on a minute. Whatever happened to praying, Lord, help me. That is the greatest prayer ever. Oh, God, help me. Putting our faith in God becomes very important, beloved. We see that here. And so if we're facing a challenge, and you might be facing something significant today, let me pray with you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody watching, and we all join our hearts in our prayers. Lord, we put our faith in you. We don't put our faith in something else. But Lord, you are the one. It is you who heal. It is you who do miracles. You do everything and anything. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us, give us your will. That's what we pray for on this day the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen. We just want to say thank you to our partners who've helped us all get this far and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. Herod the Great was just called King Herod during his lifetime, but I'm sure he'd be very pleased that history remembers him as great. Herod seems to have been obsessed not only with keeping his power, but growing it and causing it to last well beyond his death. It seems that Herod needed to be known by all, and if not loved by all, then at least revered or feared. A good illustration of this is Herod's plan to build a mausoleum city for himself. In 28 BC, Herod the Great began preparing for his death. While he would not die for another 24 years, Herod wanted to create a fortress that would be a fitting monument to his great name, a place worthy to house his body after death. With an eye for the dramatic, Herod the Great chose a hill in the Judean desert, about 10 miles southeast of Bethlehem. There, he ordered that the hill be enlarged, thickened, and shaped into more of a cone. He also had a nearby hill shaved down, so it would appear diminished beside his city. Herod naturally named this architectural feat after himself, Herodium. On the top of his hill, he built a palace fortress surrounded by two walls that were crowned with four towers, one on each compass point. For the base of the mountain city, Herod ordered that it be raised off the valley floor several feet. Then he built another larger, more luxurious palace, which appears to have been where he spent most of his time. Once completed, Herodium would have been quite the contrast against its backdrop of Judean wilderness, a beacon of man-made glory complete with watered pools, colonnades, and colorful gardens, watered thanks to a six kilometer long aqueduct. Even the slope of the hill was not without its structures, a theater to seat three to 400 people and a monumental stairway that led to a mausoleum. The question of exactly where Herod's burial place was within Herodium is still one of debate. Late archaeologist Ehud Netzer championed the research surrounding the so-called mausoleum found on the slope. In that area, Netzer also found the scattered remains of a red limestone sarcophagus. To him, this could be none other than Herod's casket, plundered, crushed, and scattered by disgruntled subjects after his death. 
To some, however, the monument on Herodium Slope does not seem to match Herod's over-the-top personality. While the monument was truly decadent, another theory places his final resting place in the highest tower on the summit of the mountain. Thanks, Corey, for that excellent piece. Well, on yesterday's program, if you remember, we took a close-up look at the life of Simon Peter. And today, in continuation, we're going to be looking at another of Jesus' disciples. He's known famously as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is John the Apostle. John, though just a simple fisherman from Galilee, was about to become one of the 12 disciples and future apostles of Jesus Christ. He, along with his brother James and their father Zebedee, as well as Peter and Andrew, were busy with their fishing business when Jesus called these four young men into service. Not only was John to become one of the twelve apostles, but he, along with Peter and James, were a part of Christ's inner circle of disciples. In fact, Peter, James, and John were Jesus' best friends and witnessed events that the other disciples did not such as the raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration when Jesus met with Elijah and Moses, and Jesus' private prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was John and Peter who were entrusted with preparing the Last Supper. Even after Jesus returned to heaven, these three continued in the ministry and became what Paul the Apostle described as pillars of the church. Jesus nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder, possibly referring to their overly bold and impulsive style. Indeed, as Bible commentator Stephen Miller observes, when the Samaritans refused to welcome Jesus and his entourage into their city, the brothers sounded a bit like they had a hotline to lightning. Should we order down fire from heaven to burn them up, they asked? Another time, John ordered a man exercising demons in Jesus' name to stop because he was not one of the twelve disciples. The boldest request they made, however, was to sit beside Jesus on his throne. Jesus, of course, denied all of these requests. However, it is notable that the only other person to receive a new name from Jesus is Simon, who he gives the name Peter. This means that the three inner circle disciples all received new names. Yet according to tradition, John was not just one of the inner circle disciples, but was the beloved disciple of Christ, the one whom Jesus loved. Indeed, it was to this man, rather than to his own brothers, that Jesus entrusted his mother Mary. Interestingly, both John and the Old Testament prophet Daniel are called beloved of God, and significantly, both also are the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. Indeed, traditionally, it is believed that John the Apostle penned Revelation, as well as the Gospel of John, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John also. And according to the early church, all the other disciples but John died a martyr's death, John's brother James being the first. As for John, he apparently left Jerusalem around AD 65 for Ephesus, where he wrote the fourth gospel and the three epistles. Later, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he received dramatic visions from the Lord and penned the book of Revelation, which is titled in the oldest of manuscripts as the Apocalypse of John. After this, John apparently lived in Ephesus and died peacefully at a ripe old age. Like all of us, John was a human and so he had his downfalls, but ultimately he was loyal and was one of Jesus Christ's best friends and would be later described by Paul the Apostle as one of the pillars of the church. That's in Galatians 2.9, by the way. Now, something else I've said before but bears repeating is that both John and, uh, John and the Old Testament prophet Daniel were called greatly beloved of God. So it's interesting that these two are also the greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. And the one scholar says it this way, because of their faithfulness and obedience, God disclosed revelation to them, not given to any others. Really, really amazing. You know, that, that is amazing. And, and we need to understand that John saw Jesus Christ in different states. He saw Jesus Christ before. He was uh, crucified and all that stuff. And then he, he traveled with Jesus Christ. He was empowered. He was at the Garden of Gethsemane, like you said, and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but then he, he sees Christ die and he's present at the crucifixion. And, you know, his mother, Jesus' mother Mary's committed to him. And you're like, Instead, what? rather than his brothers. Yeah. Exactly. Isn't that, that says something. Mm -hmm. And I that's mean, says a lot. stunning. Yeah. That's stunning. Yeah. Because, you know, it's believed that his brothers didn't really come to know the Lord until he rose from the dead. But yeah. anyway, the idea is that 
that John is aware of something going on. And I think, I think the time when he, it was given to him, he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos. And mm -hmm. I've been on the Isle of Patmos. We went there and did a TV special uh, about the prison of John. And uh, we went out into the wilderness there. It's a small little island. But uh, the, the plants are very nasty. We had to wear boots because we, you know, I mean, John's walking around on the Isle of Patmos with bare feet. And he would have been, what, 90? Around yeah, 90? like he's old. I can't even imagine Like, that. I mean, that's, know? I mean, they probably figured, well, he's just going to go there and die. And die. And they, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> he's the revelation die. of Jesus <laughs> Christ. Exactly. <laughs> the final book of the Bible. But, but he, he just, just let him die and get out of the way and... But God shows up there yeah. on the Sabbath day. And I, I would imagine John himself was like, yeah, well, I'm just going to die. And, you know, I just yeah. want to be with Jesus. Yeah. But God, like a trumpet behind him, shows up and says, excuse me, John. <laughs> yeah. Pay attention. Yeah. Write this down for the churches to see it. And John's like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. what's going on? And suddenly heaven is exploded to him and he sees everything. He sees it and he can only describe it based on his mind. And there's a lot of things described in Revelation that are based on his mind. But it's important to remember that he sees Jesus Christ and then he comes out of that revelation and tradition says, not the Bible, but tradition says he goes back and he ends up in Ephesus. Hmm. And he's in Ephesus. And they're carrying to church. And all hmm. he can say is little children love one another. Mm -hmm. That's his last words to the church. Love one another. It's amazing. You know, and we see early in his life, he was one of the one half of the sons of thunder, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, but, but he calms down later in life. And isn't that interesting? Yeah. You know, as he... After the, after the crucifixion. Yeah, yeah. As he, you know, he is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And even after mm -hmm. Jesus raises and ascends, mm -hmm. that relationship continues. And isn't it amazing how the Lord changes us? Yes. Right? Yes. Very much. I, I think, just have one more comment, and that is, you compare him with Daniel, who's also called Beloved in the Hebrew, who, is, who lived back in 500 B.C. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, you know, he lives, first of all, he's a priest. He's supposed to be at the temple, but they take him out of there, and, you know, we don't know, but suspect that he's castrated and all that because of working in, in the uh, temple with Nebuchadnezzar and all that. But he goes through Nebuchadnezzar, he goes through all of these kingdoms, and, you know, at the end of his life, he's given a revelation. This is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But you don't really know what happens to Daniel because he, he just dies. Yeah. And John, it's the same way. So this is amazing, the beloved of God. Well, and I think, too, as you were saying, you, you can see the, the personality of John change. And I think John was a people person. Had I think, be. like, deep inside, he, he watched relationships. Mm -hmm. He was very careful. And I think he really observed Jesus a lot in how not only he responded to John himself, but to the other disciples and to the people around him. And I think that's what's really amazing. Even um, one of my favorite uh, things about John was when, um, when, when Jesus, after his resurrection, came back, remember, and he had breakfast ready for the, the disciples on the, on the shore, mm -hmm. and he wanted to talk to Peter. And, and really, he was, he was drawing from Peter, Peter, do you, do you love me? And, and, he, and he brought that back because Peter had denied Christ three times and, and Jesus made a way for Peter to kind of come back and say, yes, I love you three times. But Peter looks back and he sees John coming and he's kind of like, man, like Jesus. Why I'm, is he here? Why, can, can this just be a moment between us? And, and Jesus basically said, don't worry about it. It's okay. Like he's okay. I think John was in that training period of mm -hmm. of being able to be that one to record events that others would have missed. The others were probably sitting around eating their fish, right, and having a good breakfast. But John was concerned with events and, and marking them down and really putting them in his heart. And I think that that was a real preparation for this revelation at the end of time. John 21, that's why we have that. We have that incident. Because of John. Because John exactly. was, yeah. And, and the, yeah. the other time is when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He tells the women first. And uh, so, so they run there and John beats Peter. Yeah. Like John was, he was either younger or he was better shape or something. Mm -hmm. He beats Peter. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't go in because mm -hmm. he's trying to 
and he's watching. Yeah, he's, he's trying observing. to make sure that he's mm -hmm. not, you know, uh, unclean, mm -hmm. right? Unclean. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, John is just, I can't wait to meet him. Mm -hmm. He's just an amazing, I mean, he, Daniel and John, those are the two I'm looking forward to meeting. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, I mean, I'm going to see a lot of people there, but I, I, I'm just Good looking thing we forward have forever, huh? to meeting John and meeting Daniel. I mean, they're, they're great men. Well, I think we've, we've done a good job stalling now for Ryan for this time <laughs> Thank you. to come that. and for you to make sure that you have read Luke chapter 7. It's a multiple choice today, so just relax. Um, you have a one in three chance of knowing what the answer That's is. not bad. Even if you haven't read the portion today. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 7, and um, we have Jesus healing the centurion's servant. And then the day after, he goes into another city. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead. What was the name of the city where that happened? Was that in Capernaum? Was that in Nain? Or was that in Gennesaret? Hmm. Where would that be? Ryan, what do you think? I think I'm going to, it's a tough question. I'm going to go with number two, I think, Nain. Nain. Well, and if you chose that at home, you're absolutely right. If you look at Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Now, it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and that many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And then it talks about how that uh, Jesus had compassion on this widow and raised her son from the dead. You know what Nain means? Nain is a comment on beauty. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting. I'll tell you right now. Uh, anyway, it's good. Good job.